exploring the back alleys off of the tourist track in Venice really brings out kind of an adventure spirit for the kids. It's lots of fun, and you get a more authentic feeling of what it's like to live here. And the back alleys give you a chance to get away from the crowds and get a feel for the rich culture of this town in music, architecture, the Cabernetti Palace, they're all children, and history. So it was something like this. Wow. All right. Now you don't know who I am. He's mustache man. Explore all that Venice has to offer for families in Travel Kids Venice! I'm Nathan. And I'm Seamus. And we're Mom and Dad. We're traveling around the world discovering amazing countries, new cultures, and really wild experiences together. Come along with us as we learn all about our planet and about being together as a family. As we discover the wonders of the world, the wonders of nature, and sometimes wonder, what were we thinking? In Travel with Kids. <laughs> Venice is not only surrounded by, but crisscrossed by water, which means daily life revolves around the sea. From seafood. Okay, he's alive. Ew. To transportation and services. I see a police car. While many people think of Venice as a romantic destination, it was home to the original Casanova. They might not plan a stop here with kids, but Venice has a lot to offer families. Just laying eyes on the place, kids see a magical fairy tale land. There really is nothing else like this on Earth. Although it looks like one big island, Venice is actually made up of dozens of smaller islands, intersected by canals and connected by footbridges. There are no roads or cars here, which means you don't have to worry about the traffic and kids. And evenings spent without the noise of cars and horns sure makes for a relaxing destination. Plus, the kids love the food. Mamma mia, in the pizzeria. Gelato ice cream, yay. Pepperoni. <laughs> and the different ways of getting around. Venice is connected to mainland Italy. It's going to Venice on a bridge in the water. But once in town, it's all canals. Wow. That's cool. But it's like actually in the street, because it's not just this one river going down, it actually occurs in between all the buildings. I think I'm in a dream right now. So everything is done by boat, including cargo boats, water taxis, and Vaporetto, or water buses, which transport people down the Grand Canal, a wide canal that snakes almost two miles through Venice. What do you mean wait for a bus on water? Smells like seawater. The smaller canals are crossed by bridges and trigetti, which are like little gondolas that ferry people from one side to the other. So we hop on a trigetti and cross the canal, wander along some of the back streets where we meet this British family who's recently relocated to Venice. And they show us what's below the water here. You take your finger, okay, and you hold it there, and then you click the line back. So you're holding the line with your finger now. Oh! Yay, yeah, he's still alive. Throw him back in! Throw him back in! And fill us in on the history. Venice didn't always look like this. Back in the first and second centuries, there were just a few shallow, muddy islands barely breaking the surface of the marshlands of the Venice Lagoon. 
Most historians agree that the constant invasions by Germanic tribes to the north and Huns to the east caused the locals to build these islands up to live in a more secure location. And they run to where they could eventually hide in the lagoon, in the big marshes and on the islands at the north of the lagoon. They used wood from forests north of Venice and actually pounded the logs down through a thick layer of mud and sand into a stronger bedrock. And underneath the mud silt flats of Venice, they put thousands and thousands of trees, tree trunks. They then lined the area around these pylons with rock and stone and built foundations on top of them. By the 9th century, Venice became a powerful maritime city. By the 12th century, Venice had built one of Europe's largest pre-industrial revolution factories, an arsenal producing ships and arms. And by the 13th century, the city operated over 3,000 ships and was powerful enough to finance crusades and take over Constantinople. Its location at the top of the Adriatic Sea along major trade routes both on land and the sea brought the Republic of Venice a booming economy. Each country, Germany, France, England, would have a huge great building in which all their traders would store all the produce and things they had bought or collected from the Far East. And then they'd sell them here and move them in mules across the mountains to France and to Spain and to England. The wealthy citizens here were also patrons of the arts, and Venice developed its own school of art and architectural style, Venetian Gothic, with influence from the Eastern Byzantine and Moorish cultures. And music with famous musicians like Vivaldi and Mozart taking up residence here. Today, the tradition of music is still an important part of the Venetian lifestyle. So we head out through the back alleys of Venice, winding through tall buildings. Remember, there are no cars here, which means lots of walking. Strollers are probably not a good option. But turning it into a game helps little ones keep occupied and forget about how many miles they're logging. See the lion up there with the wings? That's a symbol of Venice. So you see that in the flag, you see it all over town. Let's count how many lions we can find in Venice as we're going around, okay? One. There's one, so let's keep looking. And in no time, we find Barchetta Blue, a local school that focuses on music and language. Our children are, are very used to listen to classical music, and it's quite a normal thing for them who's putting on a concert with an American school. Well, today we organized a concert exchange between these two schools. The kids learn to play instruments early here. This group, uh, they begin from th the three years, pia piano, violin, and rhythmic as well. But music is not the only historical art that is being kept alive. At the peak of the Italian Renaissance, when the Republic of Venice was thriving, mask wearing was very typical. And at Kamakana, you can check out these masks. Soprano, soprano. So we head through the tiny back streets of Venice to find the shop. All these winding alleyways in Venice can be a little confusing at sometimes. When you want to get a good map, your hotel can usually provide you one. And just watch where you're going. There's churches that to kind of base yourself out of and piazzas. And when you get there, you'll know you're on the right track. Look how close together the houses are. I've just found the side of this church, so I know that we're going the right direction. Let's go. Well, Nementa Rizzonico, I think we have found our destination. Let's check it out. Oh my gosh, that's an actual person. Oh, that's scary. All right, should we check it out? Let's go, guys. No, that's not. The shop is filled with masks of all shapes and colors. I'm Vasco. Vasco, I'm Carrie. You whitewash several times. The mask, we use white acrylic color. It doesn't need any strings, and it's held in place only by the head. It would be weird if everyone walked around like that, wouldn't it? Well, it was normal time. Masks that are deeply rooted in Venetian history. The masks were used to hide social classes. And you have equal rights like everybody else. It doesn't matter if you're man, woman, rich, poor, noble or not. They make the masks from clay models. When you're finished with the clay model, we need to prepare the molding plaster. And then we need to make a number of layers with a lot of pressure inside the mold, like this. 
Okay. The masks created uh, in this way are very flexible and light. So, as you can see, you can laugh as much as you want. I'm used to it. And it's very comfortable to wear. So I can wear it for hours and hours without any problem. The particular shape of the mask allows me to go to some dinner or some party and I can eat, drink. And the Venetians did. They had lavish parties where hundreds of guests dined and danced the night away in their masks. Today, Vasco offers us a chance to decorate our own masks to take home as souvenirs. Are you allowed to pick any of them? Absolutely. And the kids quickly catch on to the expressive nature of the molded faces. Do we have to leave? Okay, fine, we'll leave. But I don't want to. I'm mad at you. You look like a guard. So they pick out a design and start painting. Here you put more okay, and then I'm less and less, okay? Painting, fun. And our identities are concealed. You like my mask. Now you don't know who I am. No, I'm, I'm great. Looking good, guys. After mask making, it's time to wrap up the day. So we head over the bridges and through the canal to Hotel Flora. Run by the third generation in the Romanelli family, the Hotel Flora is steeped in history with 16th and 17th century period furnishings and design, but still maintains a kid-friendly atmosphere. They have a variety of room sizes, including a modern-looking apartment. They also have baby cots and strollers available for guest use and will pre-order diapers and other supplies. The location in the heart of Venice is great. After a relaxing breakfast in the garden of the Hotel Flora, where Nathan learns the art of Italian coffee, this is all bubbles. <laughs> we head out to the Rialto markets to find out where those fish go once they're pulled from the canal, or hopefully a little further out where the water's a little cleaner. In operation since the 11th century, the Rialto markets feature fresh vegetables, fruit, and seafood. Located next to the Rialto Bridge, built in in Venice is St. Mark's Basilica. Built in Byzantine style with great domes and mosaics in the 11th century, it's also known as Cezza de Oro, Church of Gold, and it's immediately obvious why. Wow. The domes are covered murals painted in gold and bronze, and the treasure room holds over 200 gold and silver pieces, like chalices. More wine cups or girls, please. Outside, Piazza San Marco is lined with museums like the Doge, or Duke's Palace, which is the former house of the Republic of Venice. Inside, visitors can see excellent examples of Gothic architecture and murals, or take the secret itineraries tour.
which snakes through hidden passageways and visits rooms like the torture chamber and the prison cell. St. Mark's Basilica was amazing, the huge gold dome, and the kids loved it, but they also loved playing out in the square. There's thousands of pigeons here to feed. And restaurants playing classical music. But be warned before sitting down, these prime seats pack quite a service charge. But there's no charge to stand in the square and hear the same music while feeding the birds. I put that in my head cord. <laughs> you feed pigeons at St. Mark's Square. There's millions. Okay, maybe not millions, but thousands. the food here and you go grind up bread and they love grinding up bread. Where's Bob? Come here, I want to put a note on you. Come here, Bob. Come here. They love the chips. And they'll stay on your arm for a long time. This is Steve. He keeps coming. Bye, Steve. But Seamus, what about Bob? Oh, Seamus, he's on your bed. After St. Mark's, we hit the takeout pizza place and enjoy a sliced canal side. Takeout cafes and gelaterias line the streets here and are much more cost effective than a sit down restaurant. And in Venice, more than anywhere, you can still take advantage of all the amazing views as daily life goes on in Venice. The work boats delivering goods, locals maneuvering their speedboats into jaw droppingly narrow slots. And of course, tourists swaying languidly down the canal and gondolas. Venice is awesome, and there's a bunch of canal boats, and the guy stands on it and paddles, and the paddle's only on one side of the boat, like that. If it's only on one side and you're just paddling normal, you'd turn and crash right into the wall, so I don't get how he does that. Let's go to find out. Gondolas have been used for centuries in Venice, originally as public transportation, at one time, there was said to be almost 10,000 gondolas in Venice. Today, they number less than 500 and are mainly used to show the tourists the sights. Oi, hasta gando. Oh, and for racing. And our gondolier knows all about that. He's the best gondolier in the world. In the world? The whole world. He's the world champ. They have a huge race here every year to determine the best gondolier in the world. And he won. The shape of the gondolas has changed a bit over the years. They used to have a small cabin with shutters in the middle, two rowers, and the ferro, or small iron, at the front of the boat was much higher. Hey, this one has an angel. We have horse. Actually, we have half seahorse, half fish, half eel, half horse. The views from the boat are incredible. Narrow canals cutting through towering brick buildings filled with history. The Cabernet Palace in front was the first prison in Venice, this one. And under bridges reflecting the sunlight for a dazzling light show. Out on the Grand Canal, we pass under the Ponte Rialto for another view of this famous landmark. But back in the smaller canals, the kids still have questions about how the boat works. How do you steer with the paddle only on one side? There is a technique. When I push the gondola side, I take this pressure and the gondola come back a little bit under your right. If you want to try, Now you can see, yeah? Turn, push. Oh, I see how it's working. You kind of like just go down when you're doing this and then straight. I'm steering the gondola in Venice. But there's more to it than that. You've got to entertain as well. Sing, please. Sing. Mama. Sing. Sing? Sing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Why not? Just one cornetto, give me to me. Dai. Can I sing it loud? <laughs> and of course, you have to pose for the tourists. 
Spaghetti no cheese. Cheese. Ecco ora, spaghetti ho detto. Cheese. Eh, vai, cheese. Spaghetti. Isn't it fun, cheese? Yeah. Candies, glass strawberries. Hey, look at the weird box. Today we are taking a different type of traditional boat, a Bragosa, out to some of the islands in the Venetian Lagoon. These islands are also accessible by the public water bus, the Vaporetto. Our first stop is the island of Murano. First settled by the Romans, the locals here relied on fishing and salt production until the 13th century when the Venetian Republic ordered the glassmakers to move their factories here due to the concern of fires starting in the wooden buildings of Venice. By the 14th century, Murano's glassmakers enjoyed a glorified position in society. However, they were restricted to living in the Venice area for fear that the secret of their glassmaking skills would spread outside the Republic. Today, the tradition of glassmaking continues and tourists can get a first-hand look. I don't bother to sign in Venice and in Murano since 1290. The glass blower, and he takes a big ball of glass and puts it in very, very, like, lava hot place. 23, 2500 degrees Fahrenheit. It was so hot that it just lighted the paper on fire. So it's like a balloon, so when he blows into it, the glass stretches out and becomes more clear. And when it's hot enough, it kind of like melts, so you can make any shape out of it. He's going to make a little animal, a sculpture of a little animal. He made a horse, and before he made a vase. The Glass Museum in Murano gives an idea of the vast history of Murano glass. You know, this whole room is glass. <laughs> Murano was famous for its mirrors and chandeliers. And some of the stuff in the museum is centuries old and very fragile. I feel like a seven-year-old in a glass shop. But as we move through the museum, you can see the progression of glass design to a more modern edge. They actually have real strings on them. And the boys are definitely impressed by all the colorful glass art. I want that. Ooh, a turtle. I like turtles. But that kid in a glass shop line made me a little nervous. So now it's time to act like a Murano glass guy and blow out of here before something gets broken. Outside, we hop in the Bergosa, head through the canals of Murano, peeking down the narrow streets at glass shops and giant glass sculptures by such famous artists as Chihuly. Whoa, look at that. And after a stop at the cemetery island. Yeah. I don't know, something about fishing off the cemetery island just doesn't sound that appetizing. Hope that's not where the fish in the market comes from. We head out to one of the local beaches for lunch. This is where we are? Yes. Yes. Although the five-mile sandbar called the Lido is the most famous beach area near Venice, visiting some of the smaller islands in the Venetian Lagoon give you a better feel for true Italian life. This is Sant'Erasmo, located just north of the Lido, this small island is mainly known for its agriculture and its 19th century fort. But we've come for the beach. It's a small area of sand loaded with locals who come in on personal boats. Although the island is accessible by Vaporetto, the little restaurant bar has picnic tables where locals feast on fresh seafood, salads, and wine. Who's ready for lunch? What are those? Yummy. What is that? Okay, sure. Like I mean, I don't know what that and sardines. <laughs> no. And after lunch, it's time to head back to Venice. The boys enjoy the ride in our Bragazzo, watching the boats and riding the waves. Ah! There was like this big, deep drench, and we went in it and came back out, and the wave came back out with us. Got toppled by the water. Soaked from head to toe. The boat driver drops us in the residential Venetian district of Canareggio, which was once home to the Venetian ghetto, an area the Jewish people of Venice live. This is like a really old area. The area near the lagoon offers a peaceful respite from the tourist packed Venice. But as you get closer to the Grand Canal, the trinket shops, Six 
all glass candy. Diamonds and jewels. And restaurants reappear. Hey, do you guys want a hot dog? I know something even yummier than chocolate. Let's go look. No! So after wandering the streets here, it's time to get back to the hotel. Because Joelle, the owner of Hotel Flora, has offered us a boat tour like the locals do. You want to have a small tour? Hop in the boat. Okay. Rowboats have been replaced by speedboats as the given mode of transportation for the locals here in Venice. Think Italian job versus summertime. And the kids went about boating early here. Can you hear that? Monday he's going to start sailing. Joelli and his family have great insight into what makes Venice especially attractive for families. Oh, I think uh, it's nice because, uh, first of all, because uh, Venice is different and uh, it's something that you have to discover. With children, you have a lot of things to, to see and to do now. You have a different uh, rhythm uh, of life, you know, and uh, that's uh, for us uh, is our normal life. So in the afternoon, uh, you can have a break and take the boat and just uh, around. So they guide us by the beautiful palazzo and museums along the Grand Canal and along the everyday life behind the scene type canals. Like a garage, you know. Oh, they have their garage. Vegetables! Where's the fruit one? Where cargo boats unload their goods and market boats make for floating stores before treating us to a true Venetian afternoon treat. So this is called Cecchetti and it's famous here in Venice. You can sample all different types. We have tuna here. Like bitter chocolate and tuna. This is with uh, crab. This is stockfish with garlic, or no garlic. It's basically like different spreads and salads on a crusty bread. Let's start tasting. And the kids even get into the action. Italian life for the kids and us.